this lecture of the Explorers Club that we are all very much looking forward to. I'm Rosalie Lopez. I am the uh, Chief Scientist for the Planetary Science Directorate at JPL. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from Pasadena, California. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce my fellow planetary scientist, Explorers Club uh, uh, fellow and uh, Lower Stomo awardee, uh, Lindy Elkin Stanton. Uh, Lindy is a, an amazing scientist who is right now uh, at Cape Kennedy uh, getting her spacecraft ready to launch. Uh, she's the principal investigator, that is the lead investigator for the Psyche mission uh, that's going to a very unusual asteroid. Uh, Lindy is also um, vice president uh, of the Interplanetary Initiative for the Arizona State University. She's co-founder of Big Learning, which is a, a, a tech company um, uh, training and, uh, uh, and measuring collaborative problem solving and critical thinking um, uh, uh, problems. Uh, and um, um, she has done research on Earth as well as the planets, in particular the um, evolution of um, terrestrial uh, uh, planetary uh, bodies uh, that is like uh, the Earth and asteroids and uh, solid planets. Uh, and uh, uh, on top of that, uh, she also is, uh, you know, a great person to do outreach. Uh, she's a real inspiration uh, for girls uh, and young women. And uh, if I had a daughter, I would buy her this book uh, because uh, I think that girls and young women who are interested in science uh, need role models. And. Uh, um, I uh, will give you a little bit more background about Lindy. Um, uh, she received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from MIT. Uh, she was also a researcher at Brown University faculty at MIT, um, a, a director at Carnegie Institute for Science before moving to Arizona uh, State University. She has numerous awards, including the Lowell Thomas, uh, she's also a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Mineralogical Society, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and uh, she was last year elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Lindy, and uh, you know we're all rooting for. Uh, the psyche mission to launch uh, successfully uh, soon. Uh, Lindy, over to you. Thank you. Rosalie, thank you so much. And that is such a lovely introduction, and I'm so touched and just honestly thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, I'm just now sharing my screen. I think it should be up now. Can you see? Uh, I'm looking to Rosalie to see if my slides are up. I think so. Uh, Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so what you're seeing here is a cover of my book. And and so this was the, the, the catalyst for this talk tonight that Ann Passer was kind enough to see. So I had this memoir coming out June 7th and suggested it might make a nice Explorers Club talk. And so it's going to be a little bit of an unusual talk because I am going to talk about things that happen in this book, in my memoir, and I'm going to talk about exploration. So I've been a, a fellow of the Explorers Club since 07, and I'm just so pleased to be with you here tonight. So let me start with uh, tell you a little story. Yeah, I, I like this picture because it, to me, <laughs> signifies the curvy career path that I've had. And Rosalie's just given me a beautiful introduction, which makes it sound like uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at some, you know, peak of scientific um, uh, uh, productivity and uh, lovely and incredible privilege in basement and we're expecting much later this year. But I would say that, especially if you knew me in my late 20s and my early 30s, I did not look like a shiny candidate for scientific success. And this is a lot why I wanted to write this memoir because uh, in my late 20s uh, and around the age of 30, I was a single mother and I just decided I was going to go back and get my PhD so that I could stay in academia. 
And in fact, I started my doctorate at the age of 31, which is considered more or less 10 years too late to be a really serious refine because you're supposed to go straight through for your PhD. And instead, uh, I worked in business and ran a little company of my own and I learned how to train border collies and I raised sheep and I did other things during my 20s, got married. Then my son got divorced and then I decided to go back to graduate school. And at that time, I was also uh, intensely suffering from depression and anxiety, which was the result of um, uh, traumas during my childhood. And I share this because I think a lot of people think that to do things in research science, uh, you know, you've got to really know as a young kid where you're going and you've got to go there straight. And I absolutely did not do that. And um, so there I was starting grad school. Uh, my son started kindergarten the same week. And, and I was in my 30s and I was just getting my act together. And um, most of this has followed from there, from a pretty inauspicious beginning. And so really the point of my story is the curvy path that you can have through life and the things that you can learn to care about are not always the things you thought about in the very beginning. So here I am in my early 30s doing uh, field work in the Sierra Nevada um, and uh, other volcanoes. And this was old volcanic rock from Sierra Nevada. And at that moment, I became very interested, not at this exact moment when I'm sitting on the outcrop, but in graduate school in my 30s, I became very interested in the end Permian extinction. And this is a photograph on the left of some columnar basalts uh, from a giant volcanic eruption that happened at about the same time as this extinction, which was the largest extinction in Earth history. It was much bigger than the one that ended the dinosaurs. At the end, Permian, um, all trilobites went extinct. I really love trilobites. And so for those of you who are fossil fans, you probably do too. Some of them were 70 centimeters large. Did you know that? End of the trilobites, end of the crinoids, end of the eurypterids, and the end, in fact, of over 90% of species that lived in the oceans and over 70% of the species that ended up on, that were living on land. So a huge extinction event in almost the end of multicellular life on Earth for a little while. And at the same time was this, was this volcanic eruption. Now here's a picture of the globe and you can see we're looking at Asia. And in fact, we're looking at Siberia. And in blue up there is um, all the area where the lavas of these eruptions are um, underneath younger rocks. But if you dig down with drill holes, you can find them. And in pink, it's where there are the superficial bedrock. So if you find a river cliff or you manage to burrow through all the permafrost and, and, and sphagnum moss, then these are the rocks that you find. That is a vast area of land that this eruption covered. And when I was in graduate school, I was reading about this. I was reading about the extinctions and I was reading about this giant eruption. And the thing that just boggled my mind is that no one was really sure whether the eruption caused the extinction, whether it was possible for the eruption to cause the extinction, or even what caused the eruption itself. And so I started working on this. And um, a number of years later, uh, before I had my first permanent faculty position, we were writing a proposal to see if we could solve this mystery. And we ended up being funded by the National Science Foundation. And we had a team of about 30 scientists from eight different countries to look at this from many different points of view. And this is the beginning of a, of a real passion that I have for um, doing science in interdisciplinary teams, because I actually think that's the way that we make the biggest forward progress in knowledge. So with this funding, over um, six field seasons, you can see between 2006 and 2012, we went to all these places in green. Now look how big this map is. If you look down at the lower right, there's Lake Baikal. So the bottom of this map is uh, really just touching Mongolia. And the top of this map is the Arctic Ocean. On the left, it goes to the Ural Mountains and on the right, all the way out to the Lena River. And so in the striped area, that's where these volcanic rocks are our bedrock. And look at all the places that we went on these different field trips. And so, of course, this being the Explorers Club, what I really want to do is show you field photos. <laughs> so, and so uh, we started out in, uh, in 2006, those brand new young faculty members uh, at, at MIT. I was hired back on the faculty there, which just blew my mind because I had such an inauspicious beginning. And I was out in the field in Siberia with the team for the first time. And there were a lot of mosquitoes. 
and we would play that time-honored game of uh, close your field notebook and see how many mosquitoes you kill, and <laughs> whoever kills the most wins. And so these, this was field, field notes from 2008, where I, I believe this particular one, I, uh, I won with uh, seven or eight mosquitoes in that snap. And we would cook our meals um, morning and night. We didn't have lunch, but we had breakfast and dinner uh, on a pot over, over, a, over a fire like this. And we learned that in the it was not that much, um, so which was tough on us Southwesterners who were used to three meals a day. But it's 24 hours a day light, and so we have very long field days, and we eat great big gigantic breakfasts and dinners. We had the, the classic, and if, if a number of you have done field work in Russia, you know, it is just such a pleasure, and the colleagues are fantastic, and everyone has sweetened condensed milk in their coffee, including, in this case, you can see sweetened condensed milk. Not so much the mosquito bothers me, but the anaerobic mold under the lid, but everybody was fine. No one got sick. All the field seasons, no one was injured. Quite amazing. And we camped in some astonishing places, uh, way up north, well above Arctic Circle, and then down south, and always traveling along rivers where you can find rocks. And that's my little tent on the on the on the uh, shores of the Kachuri River. And we had uh, different kinds of transport. This was one of the uh, maybe more questionable. We built a pontoon built a boat out of these two inflatable pontoons and uh, and a bunch of driftwood. So that's Ben Black on the right, who at the time was working on his PhD with me, and now is faculty at Rutgers. And on the left is Scotty Simper, who's just an astonishingly great outdoor photographer, cameraman, and, uh, and, and film producer, who came with us. And so there I am with one of the more sketchy inflatable boats that we used. And um, sometimes we walked really long distances across the trackless uh, wastes of Siberia. What a huge, huge area that is. And so we'd be dropped mostly by helicopter, spend two, three, four weeks out going along rivers or hiking over land. This is me hiking behind Brad Hager, who was uh, a professor at MIT, probably come on. And uh, we carried the Explorers Club flag two different times. Here's our team with uh, There is out on, on reindeer to find promising places for, for mining minerals. I think we were the first non-Russians ever to go there. We carried the flag uh, another time uh, on the on the um, on the Angara River. And there's part of the team from from that year. And we had some amazing adventures. Uh, in this is in a little tiny town um, on an inlet of the Arctic Ocean. And they have a uh, board using tunnel bore into the side of the river cliff below the permafrost line and made a frozen cave where they keep the frozen remains of mammoths that they take out of the permafrost. So on the right, you can see some mammoth fur from a whole mammoth that was in a great big frozen chunk and it touched this fur, it's 25,000 years old. There I am on the left. You can see the bricks behind me. Those are frozen water ice bricks that they use to pave the, the ground of this, of this amazing mammoth museum. Um, so what about the science that we did and the adventures that we had? So, so the people I was in the field with and all of you who've done these field expeditions in remote places know how you can either break apart and kind of hate <laughs> or you can come together and just bond in ways that are almost astonishing, which is what we did. And so lifelong friends. And here we are again on the Kutui River. And these rocks are not volcanic rocks. These are limestone. So it turns out that a very, very important part of this eruption was the country rock, that is the crustal rocks that were already there, but when the magma started rising out of the mantle and becoming chambered, that is lying in the liquid state between the rocks that already existed there in Siberia um, before they erupted. And so, and so to explain this properly, I need to go back a step, which is maybe you're wondering to yourself, why in the world wouldn't an eruption that big automatically kill so many things and cause extinctions? Well, these eruptions were not thought to be violent. They were thought to be very calm eruptions, kind of like Hawaii most of the time. Most of the time when Hawaii is erupting, it's not driven by bubbles of gas. It doesn't make giant uh, plumes of ash. It doesn't inject gases into the upper atmosphere. In fact, it's quite calm and flowy, and you can walk up kind of close to it, and it 
we don't, you know, fall in, you can go home and you haven't died. And so there's, there's, there's no extinction caused by that kind of eruption. And that's the kind of eruption these seem to be. But what we discovered was that when these magmas were chambered in the country rocks of Siberia, they leached out of those country rocks all of the chemicals they needed to become explosive eruptions and cause global climate change. And in the end, that's the story we've been able to tell, which I'll show you in more detail. So these are limestones, and limestones are mostly calcium carbonate, and carbonate has carbon in it. And so when limestone is dissolved into magma, the magma becomes filled with carbon dioxide, which as we know, is a greenhouse gas. Here is um, uh, Seth Burgess standing by a cliff, which was more of the rocks that these magmas came into, a cliff that is made mostly of gypsum. And this gypsum is a sulfate mineral. So it's filled. So when the magma dissolves gypsum, it becomes filled with, with sulfur dioxide, which is um, uh, creates acid rain. Look, by the way, at that beautiful, giant, muscular Arctic river, and in the very far distance, ice fields, although this is July. These, these trips were just unbelievable. And here I am um, with, uh, with, with the Alexander Plutzov, and um, above the rocks that you see to my right, um, standing out in that cliff, that brown cliff, those are, are magmatic rocks. Those are, those are volcanic uh, rocks, and what we're sitting on, all the black stuff underneath us is coal. And so that's another thing that these magmas interacted with on their way to the surface was a huge amount of coal. So you've got carbon from limestone, carbon from coal, you have sulfur from, from gypsum, and you have chlorine and fluorine from some more obscure sources, including uh, petrochemicals. There was oil in this basin as well. And so what really happened is that these magmas came up and they baked out of the country rocks all of the chemicals that humans are currently putting into the atmosphere today in the modern world. And we found at last, after searching for years, we saw these on these giant geologic maps of, of Russia, but we couldn't pinpoint where the outcrops were so we could visit them. And finally we found them. These are rocks that are created by explosive eruptions as opposed to the smooth, effusive eruptions of Hawaii. These are ashes that were created by the kinds of eruptions that put plumes up into the upper atmosphere that are driven by these gases that cause climate change. And look at the size of that cliff. And so cliff after cliff, here I am on a cliff that's entirely made of these rocks from explosive eruptions. And in fact, we found that uh, east to west along um, along the Nizhnaya Tunguska River in central Siberia, 200 kilometers, every single cliff was from explosive eruptions. And north-south along the Angara River, 200 kilometers, all explosive eruptions. And so this was a huge province of explosive eruptions, more than had ever been expected or thought. There's a huge river cliff that's all from explosive eruptions. It's, it's, it's um, eroded at the top, so we're not sure quite how thick it was really at the top originally. And at the bottom, it just goes below the river water. And uh, so from drill cores, in some places, these explosive eruptive products were 600 meters thick. And so here we've got the smoking gun for global climate change and extinction. And so here's, here's a complicated a beautiful cartoon of what we think was going on. And I don't want you to take it all in, but look at this line that I've just drawn in blue. That's meant to indicate the tropopause. That is the line in our atmosphere between the troposphere beneath, which is what we live in, and the stratosphere above. And so in order to create not just local, but in fact, global, global environmental and climate change, you've got to get these climate changing gases through the tropopause and up into the stratosphere. And that's what those explosive eruptions did. So uh, they erupted a huge amount of sulfur dioxide, a huge amount of carbon dioxide, and I'm very happy to talk about the ways that we were able to know how much of this came out and then put it into climate models. But here's the kicker that I can kind of never get over. Naturally occurring chlorofluorocarbons created with chlorine and fluorine and carbon and water in these hard, hot eruption plumes, we found evidence in the rocks our colleagues in Oslo, um, Sveta Planka and Henrik Svensson, they are the people who 
uh, who led this research in naturally occurring chlorofluorocarbons, something that I thought that were only made by refrigerant companies in the present day, huge greenhouse gases, and also absolutely destroy the ozone layer. In the end, Permian, they were created by Mother Nature. As far as I know, the only example known where the Earth itself made ozone destroying halo carbons. And so unfortunately, the end Permian is really a sort of direct analog for today and it was an amazing set of years and years in the field and years and years of data analysis that has led to um, a whole suite of scientific papers, but more importantly, wonderful things like in the Smithsonian um, Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC, in the Hall of Deep Time, um, uh, can I adjust my audio? Let's see. I don't know that I can adjust my audio. I'm just on a note from Anne. I'm hoping it's not too bad and not sure what I could do about it. If someone has an ID, please text me. Um, in the Hall of Deep Time in the Smithsonian, there's, um, there's an alcove here about the end Permian extinction. And you're looking at it right here. And in that alcove is a movie um, that plays uh, all the time. And uh, it's on permanent uh, repeat. And it's actually a movie uh, about our project and one other project. And so there I am. I took a picture of myself there just a few weeks ago. And there I am on the film. And so there are two end Permian projects that are featured on this film and ours is one of them. So this is the kind of outreach that I think is great. Um, so that is the, the big story of and the end Permian. And so then I want to kind of skip back to my memoir a little bit. Here's a picture that I'm showing honestly because I love it so much. This was um, the year I learned, I learned to ride. I was seven years old. I was riding this little pony whose name was Barney. I'll never forget him. He was so patient with me. And there I am learning to post to the trot. And I was so obsessed with horses and all I ever wanted to do was ride. And I begged and begged and begged for years. And it felt like I had to wait forever. I had to wait until I was seven until my parents let me, let me learn how to ride. Um, and so I've already alluded that, you know, childhood, some incredibly lovely things like this and some really terrible things. And, and I mentioned this because not just because of this curvy career path idea and this idea that you can't always know where you're going to end up and you don't always look like a superstar. Um, but also um, because I suspect that all of us can tell our stories in different ways. I, I can tell an idyllic childhood story, me and this pony and other ponies and, uh, just loving that life so much. And I can also tell it as a story of trauma that I really took uh, a long time. So I think there's more that are shared. And, and so I say them out loud because I think that when we hear part of our story is shared by another person, it makes a bond that's strengthening and reminds us what it is to be human. So this picture really encompasses a lot. So this is me and my son, Turner. Turner's now 30. And this was on the day in 2014 when he graduated. Now he graduated from MIT, which is also where I graduated from and where I was. Um, I had just moved away from MIT and given up my faculty position there, but I was allowed to come and greet him on the stage as he came across for graduation. And um, what a lot of things this means to me. You know, this was a moment in my life where I felt like he and I both overcome things that for a long time I was worried we never would. Um, I mean, my 20s were hard. You know, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that. You know, her trauma to the point where your life will progress and you're not overcome by anxiety and fear is huge. And um, Turner now, at the age of 30, is just younger than I was when I went back for my doctorate. And um, it's such a pleasure to be able to share that and share the story with you and the story of, of, of recovering. And so obviously, I'm really obsessed with the ways that people treat each other and the ways that teams can work together. And one of the things that really has struck me about academia is that it runs on the hero model. And this is also true, maybe even more true for people who are into exploration, that um, a lot of a person's accomplishments get translated into a sense of charisma, a sense of fame, a sense that now that I've attained certain things and I have a certain reputation for whatever I've managed to get done, then I can use my loud voice to get what I want and to make sure people listen to me. And there's the danger that instead of being judged and continuing our careers based on our excellence, we become judged to continue our careers based on our fame and our charisma. And that is such a dangerous model. So in academia, what this often leads to 
is that your mountain of knowledge, your particular area of expertise, gets added to in little increments like this until you bump into the expertise of the next person and then you basically fight with them <laughs> in an academic sense over who owns what piece of information. Um, you know, but think about even Jonas Salk, he had this wonderful quote, the object is not to put down the other, but to raise up the other. And so I'm constantly working and I've been very interested in leadership positions where I could think of ways that the team could work together in such a way that every person could rise on their merits, every voice could be heard, if people are valued by their contribution instead of by how definitive they're able, able to make their voices sound. And this is something I work on very actively. Uh, and, so, and so I ask you all to think about what is a hero? And usually you say this is a person admired for their courage or achievements, and we have lots of heroes in exploration. But I just think we need to add their courage or achievements in service of the greater good. I think we have to not act based on only what we can achieve for ourselves. And especially in this world where we have less and less time to combat climate change, to repair some divisions, to bring uh, a sense of progress and achievement to more people across the world. We really need this kind of hero now and not the other. And so I'm always urging people be bold, but be kind. Kindness, I think, is underrated. Uh, and it's not a sign of weakness. It's what we need in order to be better. And so last summer, I wrote, I wrote a, an essay um, called, Is it Time to Say Goodbye to Our Heroes? And published it in Issues of Science and Technology. And it's really about ways to put together teams uh, such that we reach important results faster, we include more people, junior voices are heard, and everyone, uh, you know, the rising tide um, raises all boats. And so this is a picture of, of, of me on the right with, the, with just a few people on the Psyche Mission team with our spacecraft, um, when it was still a propulsion laboratory. And, uh, especially this kind of team building is critical for something like a space mission, where every single person who touches the mission is doing something that is critically important. So if you're in the kind of team where just the leadership thinks that they're fabulous and only their voices need to be heard and they know it all, then you're never gonna hear from the person who actually knows what the problem is and can share before it's catastrophic because junior voices aren't often heard in those teams. People get silenced instead of listened to. And yet having all the voices is incredibly important. We have this kind of informal motto on Psyche Mission, which is the we try to implement. And of course, I'm not perfect at it, and I make a million mistakes all the time. But in general, we've really been doing well. We've been doing well with our team culture. So let me talk then a little bit about um, Psyche Mission. So what is this word Psyche? Psyche is the name of the mission and it's named after an asteroid. And this asteroid we're going to see is in the outer main asteroid belt. And so here's a picture that shows you Jupiter's orbit and then inside that the inner planets, Mars, Earth and Venus and Mercury going in toward the sun. And here's where Psyche's orbit is. It's, um, it's far out in the asteroid belt, often closer to Jupiter than it is to the Earth. Why are we interested in this asteroid? There are a lot of asteroids. You see the many dots in this picture, lots and lots of asteroids. This is one of the very few that seems to be made largely of metal. And uh, we humans have sent robots or visited ourselves, planets in our solar system made of rock, like our inner planets, rock on the surface, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Earth, our moon, all rocky planets. Uh, great big planets that whose outermost uh, is gas like Jupiter and Saturn or ice like Uranus and Neptune, icy moons. We have never visited a body whose surface seems to be made largely of metal, which is what we think that the Psyche asteroid is. And so this is, um, I think, something that should be dear to the heart to many people in the explorers and the primary example of exploration in that in that um, we actually don't even know what psyche really looks like this is what psyche looks like from my backyard with the red circle around it it's also basically what it looks like from the mount wilson 60 inch and even in the hubble space telescope psyche is only a few pixels across we have shape models for it it's shaped a bit like a potato we get that by bouncing radar off it or looking at reflected light um, but in general we have no pictures of it we don't really know what it looks like 
It's about yay big. It's about the size of the state of Massachusetts where I used to live and it would reach more or less from Flagstaff to Phoenix in Arizona where I now live. It's sort of a Los Angeles to San Diego size body. So as an asteroid goes, it's big and it contains about 1% of the mass of the asteroid belt all just in itself. And so back in 2011, if you look at the top left here, back in 2011, we began to have this idea that maybe we would like to propose a mission to NASA that would test some scientific ideas we had about the building blocks for rocky planets. So in the first um, uh, million years, two million years of our solar system, now remember our solar system is 4,568 million years old. So the first two million years out of 4,568 million years is only just an eye blink. Uh, gas and dust and little pebbles formed up into bodies called planetesimals, little planets, that were the size of cities or continents maybe. And a lot of them heated up and formed metallic iron cores like the Earth has and rocky exteriors. So a lot of them had the same structure as the Earth, even though they're very much smaller. And over time, they collided with each other and grew into larger and larger bodies until we had the rocky planets that we have today. And remnants, the little planetesimals are now the asteroid belt, among other places in our solar system. That's probably where most of them are. The little remnants, the shrapnel, the leftovers from planet building. And so that's why we think that Psyche, which seems to be made partly of metal, might be part of the core, the metal core of one of these planetesimals. So we started thinking in 2011, where can we go in our solar system to see a body that would teach us about metal cores? Because we are never, ever, ever going to our Earth's metal core. It's way too much pressure, way too much heat, way too far away. And so we entered into this astonishing world of competing for NASA missions. And there, there are a number of different sizes of missions that you can compete for. And uh, we are competing uh, for, for a mission that um, in, in the end, uh, the, the part of the budget that, that officially I'm responsible for is about $850 million. And so that's actually not that by any means the largest missions are the multi-billion dollar flagships, but nearing a billion dollars, it's a pretty big endeavor. And so the way this goes is you see the triangle in 2014, the AO is released, the announcement of opportunity. So that's a great big document that NASA sends out uh, telling you how, what is gonna be required to write a proposal to begin to be considered to be selected for flight. So by the time 2014 came around after starting in 2011, we had to have convinced in our case, Jet Propulsion Laboratory to be our mission manager. We had to have found an industry partner, which we found was Maxar, put together the beginning of a science team. And by the time the announcement of opportunity is released, you pretty much have to have written your whole proposal because there is not enough time in the few months between that release date and when you have to submit your step one proposal to write 250 pages of very carefully considered mission plans. So by then we had 40 or 50 people working on the project. It's all done on a volunteer basis at that point. NASA does not pay you to write proposals. 28 proposals went in and to uh, my quite significant surprise in 2015, uh, Psyche was selected. Now, the end of 2014 and 2015 was a huge year in my life. It was the year that I took um, a director job at Arizona State University to run their School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, about 60 faculty, 350 people on payroll, spread across nine different buildings, very big job. Six weeks after I arrived at Arizona State University, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So then I had to have uh, surgery and I had to go through chemotherapy and luckily it was very early stage I'm incredibly lucky and I'm all clear today but um, anyone out there who's had uh, a challenging time with chemotherapy will understand that I um, I'm still recovering from that chemotherapy and so it was quite a challenge to write that step one proposal and do my job and try to go through this uh, this treatment so when we were selected to go on to step two I was astonished. It was just the most gigantic blessing and surprise. So, the, so NASA chose five of the 28 proposals to go on. 
and do step two. No, we're not done yet. We have to write another proposal. This uh, next proposal is about a thousand pages. And by the time 2016 ran around and we had submitted our giant concept study report, we had 140 people working on the project. We go through a, a, a site review week where the professional review panel is flown out and question us. And the whole thing, I mean, I could just like, talk about this for hours and it's so fascinating to me. And I write about it in the book, what this whole competition process is like. And you can imagine, like I felt the weight of the world on me because uh, you know, our industry partners and our other academic partners and all these people had put in all this time and this money and these resources, we needed to win. But of course the chances that we would win are very small. So when I got the phone call in the beginning of 2017 from NASA, uh, um, Associate Administrator Thomas Zerbukin saying we had been selected for flight. I just could have been knocked over with a feather. It was one of the most astonishing days of my life. I, uh, before I started phone calling my husband and my son and my brother and everyone on the team, the president of the university, everybody else, I just went for a quick walk up in the woods in Massachusetts in the winter, which is where I was at that time and listened to the snow crunch and looked up at the dark winter trees and just thought about how my life was now changing forever. So we had been working for over six years and that's about as quickly as you could ever hope to get from concept to selection. And so then down on the bottom, those are all the years of this mission after selection. And here's where we are right now, right before launch. So I've been working on this for 11 years. And in fact, right now I'm in Cocoa Beach, Florida, um, working with the team on the VECT. And I'm gonna, after this slide, I'm gonna go into a whole bunch of pictures of the hardware because I wanna share with you what we've built, which is so exciting. So we're gonna launch later this year and we're gonna then fly through space for 3.4 years. And by we, I mean the robotic spacecraft is gonna fly through space on our behalf, but I feel like we're all in this together until it arrives at Psyche in January of 2026. And then the spacecraft will orbit the asteroid for 21 months, learning everything we can about this crazy, crazy asteroid. And all the data will be beamed back uh, via radio for us to uh, look at here on Earth. So what is it that we've been building? First, I have to say, this, these pictures are just a little part of our team. At peak, we've had about 800 people working on this project. Right now, I think we're around 500 people. In total, all the people who have spent uh, some amount of time working on this project were well and people who have on this project. So when I say I really care about how teams work together, how people's voices are heard, that everyone who's really contributing is listened to, I really feel passionately about this. And we've tried to do this um, better, better than we might have. We tried to, we've tried to do it better. We've tried to do things right. And I'm really uh, blessed to work with a fantastic leadership team and an incredible team of people, because think for a moment, we've been building this during COVID. Our biggest uh, start of building of the spacecraft started right after COVID hit. And in the last two years, we built the whole spacecraft through COVID. And so this is me and Henry Stone, who's our project manager from Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Shortly after this, the chassis of the spacecraft, which is what's behind us, was delivered from Maxar up in the Bay Area down to Jet Propulsion Laboratory for integration and tests to begin. So Max are up in the Bay Area. They built the chassis and the, and the power, the solar arrays I'll show you later. And, uh, and then at JPL put together all the other subsystems and the science payload integrated together, managing the mission um, with me at Arizona State University and people at literally dozens of other institutions all across the country and overseas have contributed to this. And so it gets built in a clean environment. You can see us with our clean room garb there, which did mean that during COVID, if people were in the clean room, they are pretty darn safe. The air is recirculated very often. It's extremely clean. Everybody is super masked. But after COVID hit, JPL even shut for a while. And let me tell you, you can't build anything when the labs are shut and you can build very little when you can't fill the labs with people. There's no such thing as building a spacecraft remotely. So the, this team has persisted through so many challenges and the fact that we are on track to launch sometime this year just is astonishing. And so I'm giving a giant shout out to the whole Psyche team and to all of our supporters. I think that we're doing a miracle here. 
here's the great big um, clean high bay at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is high bay two, where our spacecraft was um, for the better part of a couple of years. There it is being and a white paint dolly holding it on the bottom. So that dolly can turn the spacecraft and tip it up and down so that the, the, the team of uh, engineers working on it can reach it from any angle. And so this is just a huge space that kept absolutely clean and where our spacecraft lived uh, while it was being built. Here's another view of it. Um, that's me on the left. And Brian Bone on the right is, uh, is our assembly test and launch operations manager. And uh, in fact, he and his team have moved now from Jet Propulsion Laboratory out here to Kennedy Space Center, where I am now, doing the final work on the spacecraft and getting it ready to be integrated with the rocket. So this was early on um, back at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he's showing me by pointing with his spacecraft, uh, was pointing with his flashlight, up inside the spacecraft at our communications panel that had just been installed and we were looking at some particular parts together. And that was very, very fun to be there on the floor because I'm not an engineer and I do not get to build the spacecraft, but I do have to understand as much as I can about everything that's happening. Um, this spacecraft is uh, using solar electric propulsion. And uh, what this means is that we harvest electricity through solar panels, which again, I'll show you in a moment. And then we use the noble gas xenon as our propellant. We have no flammable propellant, no chemical propellant on the spacecraft. Xenon, the noble gas, is actually our propellant. And what we do is we strip an electron, a couple of electrons off it and make it electrically charged. And we send it through a, a potential field, electric, uh, electric field, magnetic field. And, and, those, and those ions, those charged gas particles um, fly out the, um, the thruster of the spacecraft and they make this beautiful glow. This is the glow of the ions that you're looking at there at blue in a test chamber firing this thruster um, on your vacuum, the xenon glows blue. And so that's why the thrust on this spacecraft will look like in space. Um, they're really only about the size of a, of a small dinner plate. They're not that large. And they don't get the spacecraft going very, very fast. They don't have high thrust, but they're absolutely consistent. So you thrust using xenon and solar electricity, and you thrust all the time, and eventually your spacecraft really gets going. So that was uh, NASA's image of the day last year in October. Um, the spacecraft goes through so many tests after you got it together. Um, so you, what you're looking at on the left is our beautiful spacecraft. And um, I'll point out that in all of these pictures I've been showing you, you'll see these booms. And this one, you see the boom right now on the lower right, and it's covered with blanketing, so it looks like a triangle. And at the end of those booms, um, that one is our gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, which is one of our science instruments. We want to hold it away from the spacecraft so that it's measuring the asteroid more than the spacecraft. And it's going to tell us the composition of, this, of the asteroid. On the second boom, which is hidden in this picture, magnetometers that will measure whether there's a magnetic field. And what you're looking at on the side of the spacecraft here, all those red panels, um, red means remove before flight. And those are the covers on some louvers that will help us with thermal control of the spacecraft. So one of the tests the spacecraft has to go through is, um, is uh, uh, electric and magnetic um, uh, compliance or incompatibility. And the way that we test is we have to isolate the spacecraft from all other electric fields and we put it into this great big tent and this tent is effectively if you know the phrase it's made of conductive material and it zeroes out external fields so the only fields that are created are those of the spacecraft itself so the spacecraft was rolled into that tent and tested and it tested out fine i'm glad to say then we had to put it into a giant thermal vacuum chamber. So this is JPL's big thermal vacuum chamber, and that's our whole spacecraft. You see how big the spacecraft is because there's a person standing there. The thermal vacuum chamber is 25 feet across. We put the entire spacecraft in, we seal it up, and we uh, evacuate that entire chamber to be like space. Uh, and then we uh, uh, subject it to um, heat, like from the sun. So one side of the spacecraft is freezing and the other side is hot and we test to make sure it can do its, its thermal balance and that everything works under vacuum, which it did. So that was very, very exciting. Here is one of our beautiful solar arrays. So this spacecraft will have, um, it, here you're seeing three panels of the solar array. And then there are, in fact, two more panels that unfold and make it shape like a cross. And it'll have that great big solar panel wing on each side of the spacecraft. And those two wings together 
when it's here, think about quantity of uh, electricity. And out at Psyche, it's only about one tenth that much, but it's still enough to run everything we need, the heating, the cooling, and all the science instruments and the propulsion. So here's the spacecraft um, even coming together even better. The solar arrays have been taken off again because they need to be tested somewhere else and then brought back again. So they're on, they're off. Now see the man standing up on the left and he's standing up by um, something that has a great big um, chrome colored tube above it. And that is a technology demonstration that we're flying called the Deep Space Optical Communications. This is practicing using lasers to send information through space instead of radio waves. This is a technology demonstration that in the future we hope will allow huge data transfer rates between Mars and the Earth. And so we'll be practicing with it. We'll send lasers to the spacecraft from the Earth and we'll send lasers back to Earth from the spacecraft to prove out this kind of um, communications while Psyche spacecraft is, is doing its um, flyby of Mars and getting a gravity assist. It won't be doing anything for us out at Psyche. It's completely separable from the science mission, but it's so cool. I always want everyone to know that we're flying this deep space optical con tech demo. Here's the spacecraft in its unbelievable ship container coming to uh, Florida, which it just did a month ago. And here I am today standing outside of the clean high bay at Kennedy Space Center with the spacecraft. And so uh, stay tuned. We're going to launch later this year on a Falcon Heavy and SpaceX is going to re-land the side boosters. I cannot wait for this. I'm really excited. And so finally, I just want to thank you very much. And, uh, um, in the book, it'll come out June 7th, uh, and the website, lindyelkinstanton.com, and the mission to Psyche has a great website, psyche.asu.edu, and I and the mission are very active in social media in case you want to keep up with the news. So I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, see if there might be questions, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much, Lindy. That was fantastic. I would like to mention that uh, Lindy has agreed to, um, uh, since signing books is uh, difficult if you're not right there, that she has agreed to sign uh, bookmarks. Uh, so maybe you can uh, uh, mention that, Lindy, uh, if um, people uh, who would like to buy the book and then ask for a, a bookmark uh, can send email to Anne Passer at the Explorers Club and Anne will pass on the request to Lindy. Uh, and maybe people can also um, uh, you know, uh, contact you via your website, Lindy. Absolutely, yeah, there, there is an email direct to me from the website and I'd be so happy to do that if anybody wanted it. And uh, uh, just be grateful for the chance to give the talk and talk about these Explorers Club style adventures I'm having. And this is exploring a, a completely new world uh, because no one has ever been to a metal asteroid. So I'm very excited about the Psyche mission, uh, you know, particularly uh, about any form of, um, you know, volcanism that we might see there, you know, likely volcanism, but uh, it, 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 they are really uh, mind blowing. Um, so uh, do we have questions from the audience and uh, I don't actually see questions, so I'm going to um, start asking my own. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> one, uh, one thing that uh, uh, you know, your your talk, your whole journey, um, uh, it, it struck me that we all have ups and downs. And uh, uh, there are many things that are not easy, I, I think, in any career. And it seems the most important thing is persistence. Uh, so oh, I'm so I right. wonder if you could, uh, you know, give us your views. There are times when you think things are really difficult, but somehow you just pick yourself up and keep going. I think your connection is frozen. <laughs> there we go. All right, I'm back. I'm back. So, so, all right. So you said, so you, you were talking about persistence and you said, I wonder. Yes. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, how did you um, 
persist when uh, things are so difficult at times. And I mean, uh, when I heard that, uh, that you had cancer and you're doing the psychic proposal, I just couldn't imagine how you were still doing it. Uh, and I imagine that the team was really quite important because you can't let down your team. Yes. Yes, I always I think those connections are really important in the case of that moment in life writing the proposal working with the team on the proposal. The proposal itself, the, the concept of what we're trying to do was so inspiring to me that it, it gave me it gave me something it really gave me something to work toward every day something I really cared about something that distracted me from maybe feeling frightened. Um, and frozen again. Let's see if I come back. Yeah, so you're coming back. All right. Okay, there we go. So, so sorry about that. I don't know what to do about it, but uh, but live through these frozen moments. So that was, you know, that was an easy time to persist, but I think we probably all have had moments in our lives where the persistence was not as easy. Um, and I would say that I think that's one, maybe the only thing I could say that um, has stuck with me my whole life from those early traumas was just a determination that I was not going to accept the unacceptable. And, and it did not um, make me feel like, oh, I'm going to do great or I'm going to, you know, persist and achieve or persist and win. Like, I didn't think that at all. It was just, this is unacceptable. <laughs> I'm going to keep marching forward until I reach the acceptable. And so um, I feel really lucky that that's a way that I responded, you know, in addition to being depressed and having a bazillion nightmares and PTSD and all the other things that people go through. Um, that sense of determination has been really valuable. Thank you. We have a question from Maureen. Uh, how did you balance motherhood, academia, and exploring in your life? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so this is, um, of course, for everybody, I'm sure, uh, who here with us tonight, this, this concept of work-life balance is always a really interesting concept. And for years and years, I've always joked that I don't have work-life balance. I just have one thing, which is my life. And I try to do in my life all the things that I love. And so I can't say I've always been really successful at this. And, uh, you know, stress control is something I'm still learning a lot about as with this mission in its final stages. Um, but one thing I think that served me really well was that I did have my son before I went back to grad school. And it was, um, you know, I guess sadly only blessed with one child. But in that sense, it also meant that it was a little easier to take care of a family of just one child. But having him kind of go to school with me worked out really, really well. And I didn't start doing any of that Siberia travel um, until he was in high school and uh, could be home then with my with my now husband, James, this wonderful man I've been married to now for 20 odd years. And so um, so for me, it, it served me well, actually, to have uh, my child first and then go back into academia second. But I suppose there are an infinity of ways to fit into your life all the things that you love. Right. Uh, we have a question from Alex. What are your anticipated thoughts on what you could find on Psyche? Mm. So, all day, and I'm going to say it now, and I do mean it from the bottom of my heart, that everything I tell you now is likely to be proven wrong. And that is the great thing about going into space, where as Rosalie can attest, we always find things that we couldn't even conceive of, that, that were beyond our capacity to imagine. And so much of science is just having the creative imagination we can to think of what it would be, and we can never quite be creative enough. But at the moment, a favorite hypothesis for what Psyche is, is that it's partly the metal core of a planetesimal with some rock still could, um, on it as well. And so I'm hoping to see that we will see for the very first time what a metal surface looks like. What do impact craters in metal look like? We do not know. Um, and so uh, I would love that. But very possible that that's not what Psyche is at all. And it will be completely surprised and find that it's something else. And so whenever I give a science talk, I ask everyone, what do you think it could be? What could Psyche be that's consistent with the data that we haven't even thought of yet? And so maybe it's part of a metal core, 
think it's very primitive material from the early solar system that never met, but rich in metal. So it was reduced and the oxygen atoms were stripped away from the iron atoms until the iron was metal uh, in metallic phase. That's possible. Maybe it's a kind of primitive early material that we don't have any examples of here on Earth. We may not have any meteorites that have fallen to Earth from Psyche. So it could be something that is new to us, a new kind of primitive material. And that is actually my fondest hope. I would love for it to be not any of our ideas. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> it's always more exciting when it's the unexpected. And I'm sure you're going to find something unexpected. So we have a yeah. question from uh, Jeannie. Uh, what lessons have you learned investigating Psyche that you hope others will know or will learn. Uh, well, you're just beginning to investigate um, Psyche. <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, what, um, I could answer that from many points of view. You know, one one thing that uh, I hope that we're always learning, and Rosalie, this is a big part of your job too, is to try to always run each new mission a little better and learn from the lessons learned of the previous ones. And in general, I think as a spacefaring society, we're doing well at that learning, always learning and, and moving forward in terms of how a mission is done and how the hardware is built. But then in terms of the science, we're in such an interesting position right now, and it goes right back to this conversation about the hero model. Because a lot of times in science, well, you froze again. Oh, she's disconnected. Back. All right. Um, you hear me? Sorry about that. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, uh, Lindy, you might want to turn your camera off. I know it's not as yeah, nice um, for let, us. Let me but, turn my I'll yeah. turn my camera off. And I will say that I, I spent about an hour before this trying out all the different internet connections I could access from this hotel to figure out which one was best. So I'm sorry about these problems. Um, but I was going to say that it, it kind of goes back to the hero model that, that a lot of times in science, we come up with our best hypothesis. And then we tend to basically fight with other scientists about it and hope that we're right. And, and we try to be even handed. We try to do it right. Um, but in this case, I have the easiest case I've ever had in my scientific career to be completely ego-free about what Psyche is. Because there are lots and lots of scientists out there right now writing papers about Psyche and hypothesizing about what it is. And I don't need to feel personally invested in this because we're just going to go and find out. And until we get there, we're not going to know. And so, and so to me, at least, this has been the first time in my career where I haven't had to struggle a little bit to take my ego out of my work, which I think is something that truly we all have ourselves, our egos in our work. This time, I really can just wait and see what it is. And I'm hoping to hold on to... I don't know if you can still hear us, Lindy. Yes. But now I can. Now I can hear you again. And again, I apologize for this. Uh, so yes, was there another question? Uh, yes. Um, uh, question from David: uh, Do women have a different approach to exploration? Uh, do you think so? And uh, and do you, do you have a, a motto that you use in your, your uh -huh. own philosophy? <laughs> I love that. I, you know, I I hesitate to say that there's anything I could generalize that was that is a consistent difference between genders. I think that all people have a lot more in common than they have different. I think we're all bell curves that overlap utterly. So it, I don't really see a difference between how men and women explore. Um, but I do have a motto, and it's a motto that actually that my husband made up, <laughs> which is it's something that makes us laugh, which is no whining without action. Every one of us can think of things to complain about. It's very easy to sit and complain, and, and, and but you know, but our rule is you can absolutely be human, talk about the thing that makes you crazy, and then find a way to make it better. Because if you're going to complain, then it's incumbent upon you to figure out a way to take action. So that's kind of our family motto. <laughs> that is wonderful. I, I think that's absolutely great. <laughs> 
there is also, uh, I think it's also from David. Uh, why is it called psyche? Um, uh, how how does mythology play a part uh, in the name? Right. Um, oh, that's a great question. And so, um, so Psyche was the asteroid was named in 1852 by Annibale di Gasparis, um, the astronomer at Naples in Italy, who discovered it. And so, this is a fantastic story. If you don't know it already, that. Um, that uh, there was um, a, role, a, a rule that was created, um, it was called the tedious Bode rule, or sometimes just the Bode rule, just uh, an equation that predicted how far away from the sun each planet should be. And it happened to be an equation that fit the distances of all of the existing planets, except it also predicted that there was one in the asteroid belt. Well, so this is, the whole thing was kind of ridiculous because if you do math, you know that you can write an equation with any number of zero crossings exactly where you want it. And so it's just by chance that this particular equation fitted, you know, in a sense, all of the, and so, and so astronomers started searching for that missing planet, the one that was supposed to be between Mars and Jupiter. And in fact, a, a man in, in Germany, an astronomer named um, Franz Xavier von Zach put together a coalition of astronomers in Europe and they had a proper name, but they also had a, a, a nickname. And their nickname was Die Himmelspolizei, the, the celestial police, because they were gonna set rights to the heaven. They were gonna make the heavens orderly again. And, and you know, like a good society, they were gonna put them straight. And so all these astronomers started searching for this planet. And soon enough, they started discovering asteroids. And that, that word just means star-like. And so Psyche was the 16th asteroid ever found. And now there's well over a million that we know of. And uh, at that time, all of them were still being named after gods and goddesses. And they were also all being given um, symbols. And so that's how Psyche came to be called Psyche. And because it was not the best known asteroid when we started proposing it, we thought we would just make everyone's life easy and name the mission after it also so that everyone could remember what it was about. So that's the story of the name. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, and uh, and I didn't mention in the introduction that you also have an asteroid named after you. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, people who discover asteroids actually can propose a name to the International Astronomical Union. Uh, and uh, often scientists um, are honored that way. So um, we got a few more questions um, okay. from Shilin, uh, your life so incredibly full. Do you ever get time off? And uh, what do you do to relax? <laughs> you know, you know, I um, in, I really, really love working hard. I just do. I think it's a privilege and a pleasure to work at things that you care about. But I will say, in the last couple of years, there have been times when I really felt overworked and burnt out, and I had to figure out strategies to delegate more work and have a little more time on my own. And um, uh, the things I love to do the most are outdoor things, looking at nature. Um, I love to bird watch. I love learning to identify plants and trees. And um, I, and I will tell you um, the most um, eccentric new pastime that I developed over the last couple of years, um, mostly when I'm in Massachusetts, is identifying um, mosses. And I don't know if any of you have really stopped and looked at mosses, but I got this idea that if you look very closely at mosses, that there would be a universe of new information in their tininess. And I know that, you know, over the centuries, people have studied them closely. So I started learning how to identify them. There's a little frog pond by our house, and I found five species of moss living on two stones. And I began to learn how tiny leaves that were less than a millimeter long could be used to identify one species from the next. And then I started noticing the tiny life forms that live in the mosses with the microscope that I bought. And I can't tell you how much fun this has been. <laughs> so that's been my eccentric way to relax is identifying mosses. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but that was my last, my last pastime. Well, it beats knitting in my opinion. <laughs> All right, so um, question from Ruben, uh, you are an amazing role model. What can we all do to encourage young girls to be passionate about space missions? Oh, yeah, I, you know, I just want 
everyone who's interested in space to realize there's a place there to do something themselves. If they, and you don't have to be a scientist or an engineer. Literally every kind of endeavor that humans undertake has a place in space. And so, so, so to me, I mean, I appreciate those kind words, but I don't feel like an inspiration. I just feel like another person blundering through life. Um, but I would say I think that the biggest problem that we have is implicit bias and, and every single one of us has it implicit bias against the immediate snap judgment we have about what others could do or what they're fit for and so there are a million ways that people react to for example girls who want to be engineers you know or boys who want to be dancers or choose your break your your stereotype any way you want and and so one thing i think it's great for us all to try to do and i try and of course i fail all the time is to stop that knee-jerk reaction and support people in anything they're interested in encourage them in any direction that they're interested in and so, for example, stopping people from ever saying out loud, out loud, you know, oh, girls aren't good at math, stopping girls from saying it about themselves, <laughs> uh, you know, just encouraging people to realize that every human has the capacity to to follow their passion. Yes, yes, that's that's uh, very very true. Uh, so, uh, go to I think what's the last question uh, uh, here? Uh, once the rock has launched, will your life be less hectic? <laughs> and what will you be doing while it's traveling through space? Oh, don't we wish our lives became less hectic. Oh my goodness, Rosalie, you're going to have to help me with this because for a number of years, I thought my life was going to be less hectic after launch. Everyone tells me it will be as hectic after launch as it is now. We're going to be working out all the operational sequences for what happens with the science data, working out our publication plans, working on early science, tracking what's happening on the spacecraft all the time. So I'm not confident that I get to go live on a desert island for three months and sleep, which had been my plan. <laughs> so is that true, Rosalie? Am I going to be as busy after launch? Uh, well, you're going to be pretty busy, you know, it's uh, maybe not as much, but um, uh, the end, and there will still be uh, reviews and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and plans and paperwork to do, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, so, uh, but I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to take a vacation, you know, not That's a too problem. long, but, um, you know, <laughs> a couple of weeks, maybe. Yeah, right. maybe, We're going to chat about that. Yeah, maybe even stretch it to three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say quickly here at the end that um, we're trying to make lots of ways for people to be involved in the mission. And uh, so one thing we'll be doing is putting all of our images from our cameras out on the internet within 30 minutes of our receipt. We're not going to censor them or edit them. They're going right out so everyone in the world can look at them at once. We have free online courses through our website, psyche.asu.edu. We have um, many, many capstone projects for students and art student artists who produce art for us. And right now we have an art show from Psyche students in uh, Terminal 3 of the Phoenix Airport, in case you're flying through, and lots more online. And so if you're interested in this kind of thing, I encourage you to come to that website. That's great. That's great. And um, I would like to thank you but also thank all the people who have tuned in i see that uh, we have people who uh, tuned in from spain greece ah. south america iceland and uh, uh so this has been great oh my and, gosh, uh, I, I think our explorers club community is a wonderful global community and um, exploring space uh, is um, something else that brings us all together. Uh, so thank you very much, Lindsay. Oh, and, thank uh, you, Rosalie. Thank you, Explorers Club. And thanks to everybody for coming and sharing tonight. I really appreciate it. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, and thank you all. Great job. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Rosalie.